So hello, everybody. Um, we're excited to have Andrew McConnell with us today. Um, Andrew is the Chief Executive Officer of Rented, a uh, leading provider of technology tools and services to help vacation rental professionals optimize their portfolio of properties. And I'll let him go uh, in a bit more detail kind of from his background, but today he's going to be introducing the concept of mental tenancy and mind ownership and what it is and why it's a problem and then how to address that. That'll be the first part of this uh, fireside chat. And then the second part, uh, Nick Durham, our senior associate at Shadow Ventures, uh, is going to lead a Q&A with Andrew and uh, kind of talking a bit more about this mind ownership concept and knowing your value. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Andrew, and give you the floor. Thank you so much, Ian. Yeah, I will share my screen now. I'm excited to be here today. Yeah, so what we're going to talk about today, like Ian mentioned, is mind tendency, mental ownership, and kind of structuring it as get out of my head. So who am I? Like Ian mentioned, I'm the founder and CEO of Renit.com. We, if you think about how pricing for airlines or hotels work, we do that for vacation rentals. So we are the booking engine for Airbnbs and vacation rentals, the professional companies in that industry. And though that's my more than day job, my, my night and day job. I am also the author of the upcoming, the soon to be released book, Get Out of My Head, Creating Modern Clarity with Stoic Wisdom. And so that's what we'll be talking about a little bit today. So I, on that, we'll introduce this concept that Ian mentioned of mental tenancy. We'll talk about why that's our default state. We'll introduce the Stoic remedy for that. And I'll illustrate it with a specific case study, an example of someone you might know. And then we'll talk about how you then work forward to become a mind owner. So I think like many of you, if you kind of rewind a couple of years where you were almost exactly two years ago, uh, March of 2020, but I'm in the travel industry, like I mentioned, and when the whole world was shutting down, we were having a very difficult time. It, airports were shutting, clients were having a really difficult time, business was in a really tough spot. At the same time, I had a four-year-old child who was out of school. Uh, her daycare closed, and so my wife and I both had full-time jobs, more than full-time, and more than a full-time job taking care of a very young child. And we were in a tight financial squeeze because we had uh, contracted two years before to buy a home pre-construction, and it was closing right then as we couldn't show our home to sell where we lived. And so we were just, a lot of things seemed like they were piling up on us at that time. And so I think like a lot of you, I was feeling isolated at home and started reaching out to friends and people I might've just texted or messaged with before, started actually doing some phone calls with friends. So I, I called a friend who had founded a company that ended up buying up tens of thousands of rental properties and going public on that, and then started a venture capital fund focused in the real estate space as well. And we were talking about what was going on, and he made this comment that we were now going to have a generation of perpetual renters. And what he meant by that was our age group, now he was doing fine, um, our age group had come out during a downturn, right? You looked at, we graduated from college in 03. If you look at the, the stock market, it wasn't doing so great right then. Then as people kind of got along in their career, went to grad school, were coming out. I went to law school right as I came out. We got the financial crisis, fell off another cliff. And then now people were starting to have young kids, putting them into school, trying to build a family, and COVID was hitting, and it looked like things were going to fall off yet again. And so you had this whole generation of people who were never going to be able to accumulate wealth to actually be able to own where they lived. They were going to be perpetual renters. And that, that concept really stuck with me for a while thereafter. But then as I spent more of my days scrolling through what a president was tweeting or what the news cycle was saying or what Johns Hopkins was saying on the latest case numbers, I realized that we had a, a more worrying trend that was going on. And that was that we didn't just have a generation of perpetual renters. We had a society of mind renters. We were giving away our mind to all the things around us, to social media, to news, to what someone did or didn't say in the office. And that was actually a way bigger problem uh, for everybody involved. And then the more I started digging on this, the more I realized this wasn't actually new. This, this wasn't a new thing that COVID brought about. 
Sam Altman, who used to run Y Combinator, and then now is the CEO of OpenAI, tweeted back in 2019, beginning of 2019, don't let jerks live rent free in your head. So it was something that he was seeing and potentially dealing with and thought he needed to call out. And even the best uh, and most well-known philosopher of our time, Taylor Swift, in I Forgot That You Existed, talks about an ex, how he was having free rent living in my mind. So this is something really uh, anybody is subject to, where other people are taking over headspace from us, and we're left being a tenant of the one thing we should actually own. And there's a reason for it. It's because the human brain was not evolved for how we operate in modern day society. You think about how we evolved for 250,000 years of human history. We're in the plains, we're in the savannas, and we're taking in 11 million bits of data per second. We have to take in all this information on the temperature, the breeze, the time of year, and that little rustling over there that could or could not be something that's going to eat us. And even though our brain's pulling that all in at any given moment, we're only able to process 50 bits of that 11 million bits per second, 50 bits. So everything else is getting pushed to the side to our conscious brain, only 50 bits are coming. And of that information that's coming, it tends to be the scariest and worst information because that's what kept us alive. We had to focus on what was rustling in the bushes because otherwise we got eaten and we did not survive and our genes did not get passed on. So those people that didn't focus on the worst case didn't you know, have a, a long life. And this was a problem before COVID, obviously, uh, as people, Taylor Swift and none, others have attested, but it's actually getting worse. So between 2016 and 2017, more data was created than all of human history before that. And in 2018, more data was created than those two years combined. And it's accelerating. It's not a linear growth. It's exponential in the terms of the amount of data we're creating. So we have this problem that's getting worse. How do we deal with it? The, the good news is it's been around so long that people have come up with solutions. And we have to go back um, to, to these people almost 2,500 years back. And they were known as the Stoics. So some of the, the founder was Zeno of Sidium, and then the, the best known ones were Seneca the Younger, who was the tutor to one emperor, Epictetus, who was a former slave, became one of the most influential philosophers of his time, and then the eventual Roman emperor, Marcus Aurelius, whose Meditations, which was his personal journal, is probably the most famous work on Stoicism out there. And for me, there's a lot in Stoicism, but this idea of mental tendency really comes down to this quote from Seneca that no person would give up even an inch of their estate and the slightest dispute with a neighbor can mean hell to pay. Yet we easily let others encroach on our lives. Worse, we often pave the way for those who will take it over. We're tight fisted with property and money yet think too little of wasting time. The one thing about which we should all be the toughest misers. So this concept of with actual real estate, you know, physical real estate or any of our material things, we'd fight and someone's stealing that from us. But our time, our mind, we almost constantly are giving away to, for free to people that have no right to it and we shouldn't be giving it to. But don't wanna be all doom and gloom. If you're coming with a problem, what do we always say? You need to show up with a solution as well. And there is one. And it comes down to these 13 core tenets of uh, stoicism that I take out of it in terms of reclaiming your mental real estate, knowing your value, setting your boundaries, accepting the gift of criticism. So it's about not building walls to block everybody out, but building gates and knowing when and how you should let others in at what price. It's about preparing for the worst ahead of time, that when the worst occurs, not suffering more than once and using that crisis as an opportunity. It's about the power of gratitude for all that comes. Non-attachment to results are really focusing on the process, what you can control. Living where you are, living when you are, saying, doing, and wanting less, lowering your bar, which is different than lowering your standards, 
uh, as entrepreneurs, you know, it's all about getting that MVP out there and truly lowering your bar in terms of what to start with. And then ultimately bringing all this all together, not just as words on a page or words in a talk, but into action, because action really is the only thing that matters. But today we'll, we'll do a double click on one of these, um, just so you're not having to sit and listen to me the whole time. And that is specifically on knowing your value. And good quote that really resonated with me comes from Seneca on this, uh, that says, each man regards nothing as cheaper than himself. Back to that idea of we give away our own time and mind also cheaply. So the, a friend of mine uh, who I, I met, a fellow founder, told me a story about when he was first starting his career. And he was driving a forklift and <laughs> thinking, wait, this is why I went to one of the top engineering schools in the entire country was to drive a forklift? Uh, and so he finally graduated and got a job as a civil engineer and, and did get that better job. And he really moved up the pay scale there. He started making 26 K a year, which equates to about 1250 an hour. And then he saw a bill for his time go out to a client. And he saw that the company he was working for was billing his time at $50 an hour, literally four times what he was taking home. And so he went to his boss and said, Hey, wait a minute. If you think I'm worth $50 an hour, I should be getting way more of that, not this 1250. And the boss had to explain overheads that not everybody billed 52 weeks a year, that there were people that were in between projects, that you had insurance and, over, and uh, office space and everything. And so this is actually what you got to take home uh, as part of the company. And so this person argued, well, then charge the clients more. And the boss said, no, this, this is civil engineering. It's, it's a centuries old profession. This is what someone with your skill set is worth. Like it's a pretty commoditized thing. You can tell what someone's worth based on their skill set. And so the only way to work more, or, sorry, the only way to earn more was to work more hours. And that's what KP uh, you know, of Shadow Ventures eventually did. He realized he should work more, but not necessarily in his day job as a civil engineer. What he started working more on was building websites. So this was a time where Java and HTML were pretty new. People didn't have a ton of experience and they were willing to pay him $75 an hour. So more than his company was billing per hour. And instead of that 75, him just getting a portion, he was getting all of it. And what it made him realize was his time was not static the value of his time was not static. When he put himself in that role of, I am a civil engineer at a larger firm, that was what his worth was. But if he was able to take that step back and reassess what his worth could be, he was able to completely elevate what he was able to, to bring home and eventually accomplish, founding multiple companies in the process, as well as you now Shadow Ventures and writing two books and publishing those and, and doing much else besides. And so the, the real lesson is don't determine your value based on what other people are saying they value as or are willing to value as. That may be market, that may be not. Question it, dig in. And then question, is that the market you wanna stay into? And so tactically, how do you go about doing this? And I like to think about it in a way uh, described as zero-based calendaring for your life. So think about the areas of your life that you want to allocate time. Now, how much of your day, your week, your year do you want to spend working versus with family, versus sleeping, eating, exercising? Really keep it at a high level, but think about where you want to be spending your, your time and your mind and divvy that up and make sure it's not adding up to more than 100%. And then on that work time, double click. What are you currently working at and getting valued at? So how many hours are you working? What are you bringing home? And what is that hourly rate actually equating to? And then sanity check, is that truly what the market rate for this thing that I am doing 
is that right? Am I getting market? Am I getting more than market or less than market? If it's less than market, maybe I can go negotiate with my current employer or look to switch as so many people are doing. But you're not locked in to just what you're doing today. There are other things you could do with that time. And how is that valued? And so start investigating what else do you love doing? What else are you great at? What else do people highly value, right? KP really liked building websites. He was good at it. And people did not have that skill set. It was not yet a commoditized product. They were willing to pay him a lot of money to do that. And that's changed over time. That's why he constantly evolves what he does and who he is and where he puts his time because the market constantly evolves as well. So again, there, that's just one of the, the 13 core tenants. I cover all of these with exercises and worksheets and case studies um, beyond KP. I have the former head of growth from Uber, the founder of DocuSign, uh, beyond just entrepreneurs have former Navy SEALs, artists, Olympians, social activists. So really illustrating how this is put into practice in all different aspects of life. It, it's on sale now. It'll come out on June 14th. Um, because at the end of the day, it, it is a path to riches, to become an owner, not a renter. As a very intelligent and very wealthy person once said, owners are different from tenants. Here's to not being a tenant. And that's something Jeff Bezos wrote in his shareholder, annual shareholder letter back in the early 2000s. And far longer ago than Jeff Bezos, Seneca said, the greatest empire is to be emperor of oneself. And to move from a mind renter to a mind owner is truly the path to becoming an emperor of oneself. Andrew, that's great. Thank you. Very, um, obviously, I, I find some of the parallels to, to real estate um, and stoicism you know, I, I don't think that comparison is made enough. And I think kind of what you're getting at uh, a little bit is uh, some of the scarcity that, that exists in the world and how we haven't really applied. Like we all understand the scarcity of real estate. It's very tangible. Um, we know that there's a limited amount of, uh, of skyscrapers that can be built in New York City. Um, right. In fact, like 90% 90, 90 of them have already been built. So but we don't apply that same logic to our time, right? Because it's this abstract con concept. Yep. Um, and also we don't, we, we all don't know how much time we have, I think is, is another thing. So it's very easily uh, assumed that we have plenty of it. Um, but I feel like many of us get to a place where, <laughs> where you know, dep depending on, um, you know, how old we are, we get to a certain place in our lives where we, we actually become conscious of the time and it, it, it changes our calculus for almost everything, right? So, so the example you had with, um, you gave with KP and his realization of, of, of his hours and that, yet, that he wasn't being properly valued. Um, he, he realized that at a young age. Yeah. And I, just, I think there's a lot of people who don't. Um, so I think it's a really, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really important lesson. Um, and especially, you know, for, for what it's worth, I think in times, like this argument only becomes stronger in, t in, in times of high inflation. Um, and we don't need to get too much into like the, the, the economy here. I kind of want to, I personally am more interested in the, the stoicism, uh, stoicism side of things. But, um, you know, when you're trading hours for hours and then the dollar, uh, you know, the, the, the currency with, uh, with which you're, you're being paid in, it doesn't go as far as it used to. In fact, it's it, the ten, the purchasing power in the last year has lessened by ten percent. I mean, you're it, it's it's a significant um, decrease and and really ultimately time. Like yeah. you are losing t time and it's it's served them in a way. Um, so you know those these these topics are like certainly something I uh, I have a lot of passion about. Um, so to get just to give you uh, a little bit of a context, I. Um, I am a practicing stoic, I guess you would, you would say, uh, in a very, as modest as possible. I have two props. Um, so my, the, the things that I keep in my office with me are two uh, drawings, visualizations. This is from Ego is the Enemy by Ron Holiday. 
Um, and I'll get into Ryan Holiday in a second because I think he's done some interesting work with stoicism. Um, and the second, which is probably my favorite uh, modern day book on the Stoics is The Obstacle is the Way, um, yeah. which I think is just a really powerful concept. But so yeah, I was excited to, to chat with you. Um, I was, you know, I think KP was originally supposed to do this, but I was uh, probably a little bit more excited because I nerd out on the stuff. Um, I guess, you know, f- first of all, I think of, sto- like, I, I think stoicism at times potentially gets, gets a, a bad rap um, mm-hmm. because oftentimes people think stoicism means um, not expressing emotion right. and bottling up your, your, your thoughts and feelings and um, essentially trying to, trying to brass knuckle uh, thoughts, beliefs, all the things that, you know, we need to do to uh, essentially con- conquer ourselves. Uh, and a lot of people are turned away by that. So I kind of wanted to get your take on some of the myths that, you, that you've um, experienced in, in your work with stoicism and how you think it applies to, to most people. Yeah, I, I think you draw a really important distinction. There's being stoic with a lowercase s, which is that, oh, he's really stoic. He doesn't express emotion, um, which is different than being a stoic with a capital S or practicing stoicism which it's a totally different concept. And it really does distill down to this idea of separating out those things you can can control and those things you can't. And when you boil it down to its basest element, there's only one thing we can control. And that's our mental state. We cannot control our body. A virus can invade it. A bus can hit us. All these things can happen. Uh, to our body, to any, you talk about physical real estate. We think we can own it, but the, a revolution comes, you know, depending where in the world you are, a war comes, and all of a sudden you don't own that real estate anymore. A building, a flood hits, a fire hits, you don't own that building anymore that got burned down. But the one thing from birth we own is our mental state. And yet, over time, we default to just giving it away, devaluing it so cheaply. And so for stoicism, it's not about not showing emotion or not feeling emotion. It's about being mindful of it, of mm-hmm. understanding, okay, I'm feeling this. Now, why am I feeling it? Is it because that person said that? Or is it because of how I'm allowing myself to react to what that person said? Because I can't control what that person said, but I can control how I respond to that. And that, it's not about... To, to me, not showing emotion, right? Like to, to just be a, a blank slate. It's really about controlling that one thing that we can control. Yeah, you know, I, I often think, as, think of the, the practice of stoicism as um, internal versus external, mm. right? Like the, uh, I think, it, you know, Mar- Marcus Aurelius, um, one of the things I remember most from uh, his famous work, Meditations, um, is just, you know, the, the act of observation of like, is this something I can, I can control? Um, and that, that in itself is a, is a practice because oftentimes there are things that we think we can control that are purely external. Right. Um, but what we always can control is our reaction to things, right? Which is what you're alluding to. Um, so really that, that reaction um, all of the, you know, the, 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 the dangerous, the scary scenarios, you mentioned war, you mentioned, um, you know, it could be as simple as, you know, we're, mm-hmm. we're all entrepreneurs. It could be as simple as a business deal, not, not closing right. uh, on the, on the timeline that you, that you wanted. And now there's cash flow concerns. Um, but really the, the, the practice is identifying and watching your, your reaction mm-hmm. and not getting sucked into the, to, to the emotional state of a, negative reaction that's not, not going to serve you. Ang- anger, um, fear, usually those things don't serve you when it's purely uh, a reaction that you personally can control. Like you have, a, you have an active choice every single time you go out to react to an exter- a piece of external stimuli. Um, so that, that's, that's how I've always thought about it. I don't know if you had a different interpretation. It is, I mean, I, I can see people hearing how we're describing it, right? These two worlds of control and not, and 
it's there's a ton of gray in the middle, which is influence, right? So I can control my mental state. I have zero control over who wins the Masters this week, right? Mm-hmm. That's something I'm. I have no control. I have no influence. But there are so many things when you talk about the business deal, when you talk about uh, protecting things that you love or people you love, you can influence those things. You can't control what ultimately happens or people do or say, but you can work to influence. You could negotiate better terms. You could send the documents over sooner. You could create competition, right? There's so many things. So I, one of the beyond the knocks on stoicism of, oh, it's just about not feeling emotion is when you get to that next level, there's people saying, oh, well, it's just resigning and not caring mm-hmm. about anything. It's like, no, no, there's a different thing. It's, there are things I can influence and I will work on that process. That's really where it is about that process over the results and non-attachment to results of saying, I can control what I think and do. I mm-hmm. can't control the ultimate outcome. And I, I think that is where, when we separate out those two worlds, that's the core, but the two worlds have a lot in the middle on that influence side as well. Yeah, you know, I, I think the example you bring up of um, kind of resigning control and just saying like, hey, if I, you know, if I, if I practice detachment to everything in my life, like, you know, can I go after any of the, the dreams and ambitions that, you know, that, that I have? That's, all, that's like a, a pretty, um, that's a, like one of the biggest arguments you uh, here against like Zen Buddhism mm. is you, you, you kind of live in this monk like state. And, uh, if you have, uh, ambitions beyond kind of being, being at, uh, being at peace and, you know, finding enlightenment, um, you know, wh- wh- where, 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 where's that line drawn? How do you find balance and going after things, um, that, 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 that you want and also, um, still serving, yeah, st- st- still, still serving the inner peace that, you, that you're seeking and looking for. Um, and actually, so I, the, one of the questions I wrote down was related to that topic. So like, this is a good segue. The idea of owning and controlling one's mind, I've always struggled with that concept mm. um, because to me, um, to me, that inherently means that like c- c- control, control is something that inherently will uh, actually like speed up one's mind and, and cause one's mind to be louder when you are seeking control. And so I've always thought, and this is like where um, Zen Buddhism and Stoicism have collided for me. Um, to me, controlling by the, the only way I can control my mind is to fully empty it, like to fully give you know give give way to the unconscious mind and then kind of let, you know, let that work. But the idea of getting out of your head, you know, your, your, your book title is that idea. And I was curious to, to think about how you thought about those two different concepts, because to me, owning and controlling is a behavior that actually makes my mind uh, talk, talk louder. And it's mm-hmm. something that I, 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 I probably struggle more with, but to me, but so the answer has always been, if I want to get out of my head, I need to empty my mind. Um, if I want to control better, better control uh, my emotions and have, um, have better observatory responses with my own uh, emotions and reactions, uh, I need to get out of my head. And that starts with like clear beginner's mind. Um, so yeah, I was curious to, to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I think that really gets back to you're not building walls, right? Like if you're building walls and trying to fight it every single thing, then it never empties, right? Because you're always fighting the ideas coming in, the, the voices. And the, the book structured and really into those three parts of mind running from other people, which may be a little clearer, mind running from events and circumstances outside our control. But then almost half of it's all mind running from ourself, different versions of ourselves, because we all have that inner voice, that inner voice running. And owning your mind versus fully controlling it 100% of the time is why I think we call it practicing stoicism. Because the default state, the default human state is the exact opposite, right? The default human state is these voices keep coming in. These things are going to keep coming in. Mm -hmm. And so it's about not 
ever permanently stopping them. It's about owning our mind so that it's mindful and it's purposeful and we're noticing what's happening. So, hey, my initial animal reaction may still be to get angry, but instead of allowing that to then dictate what I say and do, it's owning my mind to say, oh, okay, you know, I'm, my heart rate's now gone up. My blood pressure feels higher. I, my face is a little flush. What's going on here? And, and digging into that as opposed to becoming a servant to it, being able to notice those things. And I, I do think that's really where, to your point, Buddhism and Stoicism come in. Uh, you know, there's a, a great book by Robert Wright, Why Buddhism is True. And he's a neurobiologist. Mm. And he, he's saying, look, not, I'm not getting into the dogma of it. I'm just getting into, hey, here's actually how the human brain works. And this mm. is why Buddhism works this way. And it's the same with Stoicism because at the core, it's the same thing. It's releasing those things that you can't control. Mm. It's releasing those desires that are making you a slave to them in the first place. Yeah. And so it, I, I can see how the original, uh, the, the phrasing of ownership, right, that I, I'm keeping it off is the opposite of a, uh, the empty mind, but that is very much the idea of if you own it and have it empty, then you exert more control on, okay, what criticism do I want to take in? What thought do I want to now spend time on, right? Like if you sit and meditate, thoughts are coming the whole time, but do you just let them go past or do you actually engage with them and really owning that and deciding what you're going to engage on versus passively letting it happen to you? Yeah. So, so you, you run, you you run rented um the life of an entrepreneur is not uh is not an easy life uh, especially as a tech you know t technology founder in the early days it's not an easy life um the you know I, I imagine that this this philosophy for you informs the culture of the business in, in some capacity um given that you're the leader of the organization H how just curious from you know a practical perspective like how you've tried to instill some of these concepts and ideas to your team yeah i mean the team i think you probably know this about stoicism it's not a very proselytizing idea right like it's ryan holiday even let's rewind to meditations right that wasn't written for publication it was written in his personal journal to remind himself ryan He's not necessarily trying to convert people as much as saying, hey, this is a really helpful framework. These are some really helpful ideas that could mm -hmm. really make a difference in your life. And so I think it, it permeates based on how I talk and what I do. But as a company, the company culture is an accumulation of all of us. And so we, we too have our core tenets and core values there around growth about all of us better than any of us. Um, and they're not fed directly from this, but this whole concept, if there's one that 100% permeates everything we do, it's focusing on the stuff we can control. Uh, and knowing this, this was huge all throughout COVID because everybody's saying, well, how long is this going to go on? Or when are markets going to reopen, et cetera? And say, look, we can't control what a virus does. We can't control what a government does based on the virus. And we can't control what travelers do or don't do based on either or both of those things. All we can do is provide better service to the clients we have and try to get more. That's the only thing we can do. And there's certain things we can influence. You know, we were part of some of the lobbying efforts in Florida to get those beach markets reopened. Um, and so we, we worked to influence certain things, but we focused all our energy on the stuff that we could control. And so had net positive retention because we focused there as opposed to spending our mind and our energy on all these things we can't control. And I think it, it was most obvious during that period, but that's an everyday thing. Right? You could spin out on anything. You get some nasty gram from a competitor, an email or whatever. You could spin out on that. Say, look, I, I can't control what that person types in the email. What can I do? Okay, I can control how I react and now I can control what I do from here. And I think that is probably the baseline of just our mindset as a company. Mm -hmm. A couple, couple more uh, sto stoicism questions. And then um, I do want to dig in a little bit to the, 
entrepreneurship side of things uh, in terms of the time trade-off and owning versus versus renting. Um, who's your who's your favorite stoic? Yeah, I, the I mean it, it it is those three that I like to go back to, right? Marcus Aurelius, Epictetus, Seneca. Uh, I think. For me, Seneca is probably some of the best writing. Meditations, I reread the most. I probably reread two or three times a year. But in terms of some of the, the ways with words, I mean, Seneca is pretty good. Yeah, I think what's interesting about Seneca is, you know, so Seneca, um, to people who don't know his, his full background, uh, he's like a very wealthy person. Yeah. And like, you know, was, was, ri was rich in his times. Um, and he, he's, you know, a lot of his letters and his writing, um, you can kind of, you, you kind of feel the, the inner torment that he had. Like he, he, he was trying, he constantly trying to become a better person, which I think is the kind of the original it's, you know, that's a big premise of, uh, of, of stoicism in general. Um, but you, you have this like pretty successful guy who had a lot of influence and, in, and in, uh, you know, and, Roman cultures, and he he didn't think he, he he didn't think what he was doing was good enough. And I I think what's also interesting about Seneca too is that he kind of failed, right? Like the the this the Seneca end of days, um, I, I you know I don't know if I'll get the this the story the, exactly right, but more or less he kind of gave into the uh, he he kind of gave into the the powers that um, that led in those times. Um, and ultimately, like, didn't have, like, didn't hold strong enough on his principles. Um, and he had this body of work that, like, was entirely focused on that concept. And he still, you know, it still showed you this, the human, the honest human struggle that he had to live with daily. And I, to me, that it's, that is a really powerful lesson. Um, it's not a, it's not a religious text where, like, he, you know, he, he, he rose above and, you know, entered this level of human consciousness that, um, you know, like you might see from, you know, like a, a story of Jesus Christ or a story um, uh, in Islamic text, or even in, in you Buddha. know, even of Buddha, right? Yeah. Um, he was human and he kind of failed. Um, but I think there's still like a lot of lessons to be uh, learned from that. I'm, yeah, just curious to get your take on that. Yeah, I, the, there's so much to unpack there. I mean, one, uh, he failed to me is a, a tough statement a little bit because it's he to put it in context for others he, he was the tutor to nero who was one of the worst roman emperors of all time like this absolutely horrific emperor and uh, he had this quote about crimes return to the teacher and so really held himself to account for what had become of this former pupil of his mm -hmm. and to me that that's where you really have to go back to stoicism, it's the process, not the outcome. He, he couldn't control who this person actually became and what they did. What he could control was how he showed up at work each day as a tutor, what lessons he tried to instill. Now, not being there, I don't, I don't know what he did, um, but he also allowed in his writings, he acknowledges, he's like, on a lot of this stuff, you know, do as I say, not as I do. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about a practicing stoic like in terms of writing i think seneca has some of the best writing in terms of who is the most active practicing i'm i'm not sure he's up in the pantheon on that because he was really good about knowing what the right thing to do was and he had a much more difficult time Acting adhering right, yeah. to those yeah uh, mm -hmm. when when there was so much involved at the end i mean it's, it's a sad tale at the end he did ultimately commit suicide yeah uh and so some see that as the most truest embodiment of executing on those principles, right? Mm. Like the, the ultimate thing of, I can control my own life. Am I gonna be part of this system any longer that I, I, I put all this into? And he did commit suicide. So I, there are different interpretations on kind of what that meant sure. for him as a practicing stoic. But I, I would separate out how bad Nero ended up in kind of the outcome from the process of what he was doing as a teacher, right? Like what we know him from are his amazing letters and his writings mm -hmm. and trying to educate people on, hey, here's how to live this better life through yeah. stoicism. Yeah, no, I, I totally hear you. And there's, there's oftentimes I've also heard the, 
you know, the, the idolizing of Marcus Aurelius kind of in the same capacity, um, <laughs> the, the, con the context being Marcus Aurelius, and this is also kind of debatable exactly kind of what took place, but Marcus Aurelius as his last act, as this wise, benevolent king, he um, essentially gave the throne to his son Commodus, who was Rome's worst dictator. Um, and he made that act of choice and he knew it, like he knew it was a poor choice and you can kind of track, you can, you can kind of track the writing. Um, and I, and I don't, and I, I, I don't, um, I don't, um, mean to bring this up in the context of like these <laughs> stoics make poor decisions. I mean, to, like, I think it's a I, I think it's a really powerful concept to know that you can make mistakes and still have the best of it intentions yeah. and there, there's there's also like um you know like humans aren't perfect and um you know I, I i like to me that is that is a foundational element of stoicism is like these are humans that were practicing this uh this this belief system and uh at the end of the day they're still humans but you can yeah. still um you, you you can still work to become to become a better human based uh, around strong principles, uh, strong fundamental philosophy, um, that kind of like that, that, that govern you and help make your life and, and those around you's lives uh, a little bit better. Um, but right. that doesn't mean you're foolproof. Um, so, yeah. And I, yeah, I, I think that's where there's some line of anyone who thinks they're enlightened, go have dinner with your family, right? Of no, <laughs> we're not there. It, it is all about practicing it and working each day. And this idea it's an open question to me this idea of succession planning right like we had jack welch but then what happened to g after we had alex ferguson but what happened to man U after you can have these people that were great like this philosopher emperor and marcus aurelius but as a, a father with what happened with the son and the succession of the empire you know that ended up being a different thing mm -hmm. and as tough as that is the same with Seneca, their writings, we're still talking about 2,500 years later. 100%. Right? They're, they're Amazing still the powerful writings. People. Yeah, so, so the impact over time, you can still have that impact. And that, I think, is a little bit where you have to, again, separate the outcome, non-attachment to the results uh, of, I can't control what this other person does. All I can do is teach and, and all that. And yeah, I think it's an open question how much he could really control on his deathbed. Um, with Commodus, like he, he knew he was dying and he got him out there out before he died. So people didn't think that he murdered him. You know, that, that was one thing he did for him to try to put him on the right side. But ultimately, once he's no longer on this earth, how much influence is he going to have? Yeah, um, no, that, 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 that's great. So yeah, I would tend to agree. I think my, my favorite Stoics, if I had to, uh, to offer them out, I would say the one I would add would be Cato. Um, I used to practice one. Of, so I'll, I'll share this personal anecdote real quick. Um, he's the most practicing one probably of all. Exactly. Right? Like right. he's the one that did it. So he, he didn't have as many Crazy writings on it because he was yep. doing it. Right. Which is, I mean that, you know, like that's why he's kind of held in legend because he just was right. like the living embodiment of the, the art. Um, I used to do, so I learned about something he, he did back in the day. Um, he used to wear clothing that kind of ran counter to what the normal attire was for a I don't know sophisticated professional in those in those days like I think um if I remember correctly he wore like purple garb uh purple garb was often either worn by slaves or it had some negative connotation toward um in society uh but he actively wore it in public and was jeered at and, and all these things and so I um part of the reason I personally got into stoicism was I used to uh, have a very strong, um, when I would get up to speak in public, uh, th that would be kind of a, a time where I would just feel like this overwhelming sensation of, like, I don't have control over the situation. And um, I'm, I'm afraid of what, you know, of, of, of what other people think of me. I'm just like holding their judgment uh, in too high, too high of regard. And um, so, yeah, so studying someone like Cato who actively practiced 
um, working against his own fear related to like, you know, if I, if I'm wearing this piece of clothing, someone's going to think I'm a slave or someone's going to think, uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, I'm a pauper in society. Um, that was like something he did to take control of that, uh, that inner fear that he had. Um, so I, I personally started doing this. I would wear like clothing that made me very uncomfortable in public. Um, because I wanted to just like get over that, you know, this, this oftentimes just, it was just in my head, right. um, this commentary that I thought other people had about me. Um, so I, I had this, uh, I did this thing called shameless Saturdays where I would go into like, you know, uh, a large part of town and like, you know, it would be, it, who, who knows what I would wear, but it would be that the concept was it would have to push me in my comfort zone, uh, and, and make me quite uncomfortable. And for what it's worth, it like actually paid a lot of dividends. Like I, uh, it was, it was very challenging to do as you can imagine. Yeah. Um, but it, it forced you to, uh, it forced me to just, um, get a little bit more comfortable with some of those fear thoughts that I had and sit with them. Yeah. Um, oftentimes for hours on end and, uh, kind of figure out what was at the, uh, what was at the bottom of it. Um, so it was a very healthy thing for me. There, for for anyone who may be watching this after that, there are lighter weight ways to do it to do that <laughs> exposure of, exposure therapy. Well, yeah. you can do it in a kind of mental experiment too, right? Of okay, so let me play out what what is the worst thing that could happen. Seneca would do this as well. Like, what is what is the worst thing that could possibly befall me, and then is that as bad as I thought? And the way to really test it would be okay. I'm going to spend a month where I only eat bread and water, right? Like I only eat the cheapest stuff. I only wear the cheapest clothing. Mm -hmm. Like, oh wait, I, I was able to do that. Like if I had my druthers, I wouldn't choose to do it, but I, I did it, right? Like I can do it. If that's the worst thing that can happen, then I'll, I'll be good. And I think you putting yourself in that, what's the worst thing that can happen? Like people could totally ridicule me. They're judging me and all that. And then you go through it and you're like, okay, that just that wasn't as bad as I had built it up. Right. Like I, I can, and, and so you can kind of get over it. Um, but it's, there's steps along the way for totally, anybody that's yeah, not yeah. ready to show up on shameless Saturday. <laughs> um, cool. Well, let's, uh, we have a couple minutes left. Let's jump into, I, I want to kind of wrap this up with uh, your, your thoughts on time um, and time being the scarcest asset that we all have. How, how do you think about, see, so you, you started getting into like um, the concept of ownership and the mindset shift of becoming an owner versus a tenant. What is it, what, what is a really practical way for someone to take an easy step um, in, into one, both grasping the full gravity of that concept um, and two, like, I think I, I know that for a lot of people who exist as a tenant, the idea of building significant wealth seems so far away from them. Um, mm -hmm. Like it, it seems so far removed. And oftentimes it's really not, um, there's just, there's, there's a few key inflection points and compounding interest is huge. Um, so it's really just about getting, getting started and kind of being consistent. Um, so what, what are some of those easy steps that you think someone can, can take to, to start becoming more of an owner if they're existing on a, on a, on a salary that maybe they're not happy with. And I, I, I know you mentioned like, um, you mentioned like potentially negotiating a raise, but uh, I, I think taking it a step further, like where can they start actually owning pieces of businesses and, and things in their lives? Yeah, I, I mean, there, <laughs> there's a lot to unpack in all that, right? Of uh, one of the core tenets is saying wanting and doing less, right? The, the quotes in Stoicism and Buddhism and all this of don't add to my desires, subtract from my wants, right? And that, that's how I become wealthy. And so separating out your personal worth and happiness from those things is step one. Uh, that, that by far. The, in terms of where to start on mind ownership and, and stop being a mental tenant, I think it gets back to lowering your bar of it's not these 13 things. You have to go do these 13 things today. It's about starting with something. Like what is the one that really resonates with you or that you feel like you have a real problem with and want to focus on? Uh, that just start somewhere. Don't let there be a paralysis of, oh, it's going to be such a big thing. Just start somewhere. 
And then in terms of the your time, I mean, it, there's there's so many layers to that. It's I, I go back personally uh, to a two by two of what am I good at versus not good at? What do I love doing versus I hate doing? And that top right box, the more of my life that I can spend there, the better my quality of life. And then if you overlay that with a third of what do people value, and you can kind of see, okay, these are the biggest bubbles in my top right box. This is where I really should be spending my professional time to earn income. Then you can start moving that up. And that doesn't have to be static, right? What I'm great at and terrible at can change. If I invest more time to get better at something, I can move those things up. And just realizing you're not a spectator in it. You decide where you're going to invest your time. The, the next layer is just because you're physically there, physically doing something, doesn't mean your mind is there. So just like that exercise of where I want to spend my time at work versus family versus friends, et cetera, make sure that you're tying that to where you mentally are as well. There's a, a Harvard study that 47% of the time, people are thinking about something other than what they're currently doing. So almost half of our lives are spent not actually mentally present with whatever we're doing. And that's time lost. So you said you're with your kids, but you're thinking back to work and you're not getting paid for that, by the way. So that, that is not time well spent. Either spend that at work and get paid for it and get less times that you're fully present with your kids or shut out the work and know you're not getting paid on that time. So start with one thing. Really think through for me that two by two, you know, where do I want to spend my life and how do I put more and more of my life and my time into that? And then making sure my mind is tied to where my time is. Mm -hmm. for, just for, for, an, for an example for the audience, when you did the two by two um, exercise yourself, like what was something that you realized that you were not good at and wanted to spend less time on? Yeah, the things that I didn't want to spend as much time on, like a lot of finance stuff, I, I immediately went and built out our finance team. So less of that fell on me. I wanted less time in spreadsheets, things like that. Uh, and so hired for that. It, it comes back to me of, I can make more money. I can't make more time. So if there's only this amount of time, I'd rather pay someone to go do this and I'll take less to have that person doing it so that I have this time that I'm valuing personally more highly than what I'm paying that person to do. Yeah. So that, that was the biggest bucket was really building out the, the finance team. Uh, much more robustly, so that didn't end up on me. And, and where did you where did you replace the time? Where, where did you um, use the like? Where did you leverage that extra time? Yeah, I, it, honestly, to to writing a lot more. So yeah. I, I, from that, I got into writing uh, monthly articles for Forbes and much more blog posts, guest blogging stuff like that. And then that is what ultimately led me to say, wait, could I write a book? Mm. Uh, so it was creating the time to do that. Was that? Did you view that? as a separate practice from uh, your, your current real estate business? Or was that a, it, did, you, did you view those as, as uh, synergistic? The, the book ended up being separate. The original articles, it was all in promotion of rented. So it, okay. if there's one thing that helps us in recruiting more than anything, it's my articles. Cause it's mm -hmm. so much around the mindset, the culture, everything around. So it's, it's basically earned media that it has this whole trickle down effect for us as a company on the quality of people that we're able to hire and how easily we're able to attract them. Yeah, love it. Awesome. Um, well, we, we are about out of time. Um, since I peppered you with a ton of questions, do you have any, do you have any questions for me? What, what is it that got you into stoicism and, and what have you found the easiest and the most difficult? Yeah, I think, I think how I first learned about stoicism, well, first of all, you know, I, I, think, I think there's this interesting concept with stoicism in that we all like, we, we all have experienced and were taught different forms of stoicism as we were growing up. So for instance, uh, I played sports growing up. I was a, uh, I played basketball pretty, uh, pretty competitively, um, essentially up until college. And I just remember like the act of, you know, the act of playing in, a, playing in a big game and having to control and meter my emotions 
um, was always something that um, I, pra I practiced and took seriously. And it truly was, you know, it, it was a practice, like stealing your nerves in a late game situation or something like that. Um, but I didn't know that, like, I, I just thought it was kind of like through sports and it was always through that lens. Um, I think I first actually learned of stoicism through uh, Tim Ferriss, which I think a lot of people probably yeah. uh, <laughs> discovered. And, and by the way, like, you know, Ryan Holiday gained in popularity through Tim Ferriss, uh, as a lot of influencers did. And um they so yeah I, I think like he had an episode on Seneca um and just kind of started gravitating towards some of that writing uh and found it very um very impactful in my early career kind of when I was going through some of the uh the, the feared states that I mentioned earlier yeah uh in the sense of like okay there's like an actual art and a practice towards kind of working through some of the the pain that I'm experiencing and getting better and getting better um, it, I also like that it was constructive, right? It wasn't just, I'm going to go, um, like I grew, I grew up um, Christian, I grew up Catholic. And to me, the act of going to church was always calming, but it, it never, I was not like trying to solve my, I was not like solving a problem. It wasn't as constructive as I wanted it to be. Um, not that it wasn't helpful, but it wasn't like truly solving a problem. And stoicism was a more direct way to so solve that specific problem for me um so that is how i uh kind of stumbled upon it i've been following ryan holiday since his early days of writing like his blog stuff um yeah. even before he wrote his first book so yeah uh and then what was your your second question was what the the easiest and most difficult part so how you kind yeah. of discovered it and then what you found easiest so coming in versus the hardest to... I, I would say easiest um was actually in those performative moments of like using like for instance if i was giving a big talk or something um that was just like a very specific application of like calming myself down working through thoughts and emotions that i that maybe weren't comfortable um before or after the, those experiences mm -hmm. uh not that it was like the, the easiest thing i've ever uh i've ever done but it but it was a very direct application and i could kind of see results quickly I'd say the, the hardest part is just the daily, um, uh, the, like honoring the daily, the daily practice. And you, you've mentioned kids and, you know, so I have a newborn at home. Congrats. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, and you know, like there are times when your willpower is lower, you're, you're tired. Um, you're not, you're not fully present yeah. and it's very easy to just give in to those, uh, to, to give into to unwanted or um, uncomfortable thoughts and, uh, and, and desires because yeah, your willpower is low. And so to me, the hardest part is like just some, some of the daily practices of not getting angry, observing my own reactions, um, just human, just kind of the daily human, human nature. Like a lot of this, the torments and struggles that you, you, you read in historical stoic writings, uh, yeah. I'd say are probably the biggest challenges that I face. And I, I think that is the, the kind of universal frustration and difficulty, right? Is it's not, it's not like running or swimming a race where you get the medal and like that's done and you have the medal. It's like exercise or eating mm -hmm. right of, no, this is just a way of life. Like you, you, you're having to do it. It doesn't, it's not a one-off and then everything's fixed. It's, no, it's a practice that you have to continue every day. And that, you know, I'll, I'll say this, especially in our, in our modern times, I think one of the best ways for people to start practicing stoicism and something to start observing is when you are having a conversation with someone that you're in disagreement with. It could be a political disagreement, um, it, which is really common right now in American yeah. society where we are, we are in such a divide. And I notice it very strongly in myself. When I, when I am disagreeing with someone on a matter that I feel like very strongly about whether it's COVID, masks, vaccinations, like that's huge in our world right now. Um, but also could be like, you know, I mean, it's literally like any political topic. There's such a strong emotional reaction. I notice myself having them sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, and we all, and we all, we all do on one, on one side or the other, um, kind of based on our own life experiences. And <clears throat> my wife is a therapist. Okay. Um, she has a certain worldview and I have a certain worldview. Sometimes we, uh, 
agree and disagree on things. And I've noticed more recently kind of where I've been practicing stoicism um, the hardest has been in conversations when I'm in disagreement with her mm-hmm. or other people who have uh, different political beliefs than I do. Um, because I think one of the quick ways to, to just start this practicing in your life is when you observe when you have a strong emotional response to something. Yeah. Uh, usually there's, there's something going on there. Uh, it's an opportunity for reflection and it's also an opportunity to uh, try to reduce that uh, response because personally, I believe like no strong emotional response is, is very helpful to any situation. It's not constructive. It's not cheerful. So um, I don't like when I can't be objective or sympathize with the other, the person that I'm talking to on the other end of the table. Um, I want to be able to understand their situation, their plight, regardless if I have a different perspective. Yeah. And I, I noticed that uh, with a lot of our hot topics today in America, it's tough. To, it's very tough to do that. And that's really where the mind ownership comes in, right? Because the, the innate reaction is going to always be that, right? It, it, not always is a long time, but when someone says something you passionately, viscerally disagree with, you're going to have that physical response. You're going to have that emotional response. But the ownership comes in noticing Mm-hmm. And then not becoming a slave to the response and saying, okay, this response is now driving me, but I see what's happening. here. Totally. Let, yeah. me, let me start peeling that back. I mean, it's like, I, I, when you, when you say that, I hear so many parallels to, to Buddhism. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's it, there, there's so much crossover between the, these two, these two arts uh, and philosophies and Taoism. I, I don't know. If you yeah, to- totally. Yeah. 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 I mean, I have, I have a Taoist book in, in, in this office. So yeah, there's a lot of crossover, and I think um, anyone who's looking to, um, yeah, just like find find solutions to uh, to those reactionary moments that seem out of your control. Um, these are all practices that have been around for thousands of years that have helped a lot of people, uh, and I would strongly encourage uh, someone to get started. So, like, I mean, if anyone's listening to this conversation and uh, and and wants. Um, to learn about avenues to get started, feel free to, I mean, reach out to Andrew. Um, I'm happy to help too. He's probably way more knowledgeable than I am on how to get started. But um, yeah, I mean, not, Andrew, I've really enjoyed the conversation. I feel like I could uh, go on go on for hours here, but I really um, th- thanks for the meeting. time. Yeah. Yeah. It's great meeting you. Yeah. And if, if people do want to continue on it, uh, at the mandrewmcconnell.com slash workbook is a downloadable workbook with exercises to actually go through some of these things so definitely beautiful that up. Yeah. beautiful well, we shall meet again soon my friend thank yeah. you thank you for the time it's my pleasure thank you so much cheers